Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we are talking about some news on Tesla's Giga Berlin, Tesla Energy, updated short interest on Tesla stock, a new Elon Musk interview with the New York Times, and some news on BMW's production status. Tesla stock on the day-to-day -day bounced back from the end of last week, getting some macro help with the Nasdaq up 1.7%, Tesla stock on the day-to-day -day up 8.7% to $1,539.60. We'll start off today with some reporting out of Germany on Gigafactory Berlin. It relates to Tesla's cell production plans at the Gigafactory. As we can recall from the earnings call last week, Elon Musk was asked by an analyst about their battery plans for Berlin, and he said, quote, Okay, well, we can't say too much about this, except that there will be local cell production, and that will serve the needs of the Berlin factory, end quote. Well, over the last couple of days, we have had some reporting by German media on some comments made by Brandenburg State's Minister of Economic Affairs, Labor and Energy, Jörg Steinbach, that may shed a little bit more light on Tesla's battery plans in Germany. Bear in mind that for both articles here, I am working from Google translated versions, but the first article from Der Tagesspiegel quotes Jörg Steinbach as saying, quote, Tesla has started planning for the production of battery cells in Grünheide. The company told us that, end quote. Then on the same topic, another article from RBB24 wrote, a quote, completely new technology, end quote, is behind the electricity storage, said Minister of Economics, Jörg Steinbach, on Monday antenna Brandenburg. The new batteries are smaller and thanks to their higher energy density, allow for greater range, the minister said. So in that translation, I assume antenna means from broadcast from Brandenburg or something similar. But setting aside some of that translation weirdness, our focus is on him saying that it's a completely new technology with smaller and more energy dense battery cells. Now, obviously smaller could mean a lot of things. It could mean a physically smaller battery cell, or it could just be a way of clarifying the concept of higher energy density, more energy in a smaller space for volumetric density, or more energy in less weight for gravimetric energy density. So we'll probably have to leave it up to our German listeners to provide a little bit more context on maybe how that would more directly translate. But no matter the translation, nice to see these comments, and I think they would align very well with our expectations. The other information shared in these articles is that any battery production would have to be part of a second phase of the factory, and thus would require a separate approval process from the one that Tesla is currently undergoing, but clearly Tesla has been in discussions because of the minister's knowledge on this situation. This does give Tesla the benefit of not yet having to publicly disclose the detailed plans for that portion of the factory, which is potentially helpful, keeping some of the mystery alive as we head towards battery day. According to the RBB24 article, the minister, Jörg Steinbach, did not know when battery production could start from Berlin. The other little tidbit that we got from the Der Tagesspiegel article is that Tesla is still searching for a location for a design and engineering facility near Giga Berlin. Apparently they had been prospecting a site called the Europe Campus, which is a sort of sustainable and technological pilot project district in Berlin, but apparently that has been now ruled out and the location search continues. In general though, we continue to see really rapid progress at Giga Berlin. There are a number of different YouTube channels doing drone flyovers almost daily on the site, and the construction is progressing rapidly. Late yesterday, Elon replied to a tweet from Clean Technica discussing this topic and said, quote, Giga Berlin will come together at an impossible seeming speed. The prefabricated construction method in Germany is extremely impressive, end quote. I think in general, because of how quickly Tesla was able to get to production in Shanghai, there's a sense that Tesla can't replicate that anywhere else, and it was only made possible because it was done in China. And that train of thought is not without reason, certainly, but Tesla Germany is doing everything they can to prove that logic wrong, and so far comparing the milestones date by date, which Twitter user Tobias Lind at Toby Lind has done a great job of tracking, it looks like, at least at this point in the process, Tesla's actually a few months ahead of the timeline from Gigafactory Shanghai. So probably worth remembering what Elon said on the earnings call last week, better factories for less money in less time. That's what Tesla is aspiring to do. Next up today is some news on Tesla Energy. This is a groundbreaking announcement on a significant energy storage project for Tesla. So I'm not sure if the project itself had been announced beforehand, but late last week, technology infrastructure company Switch announced the groundbreaking of three energy projects in Nevada, which will comprise 555 megawatts of solar and 800 megawatt hours of energy storage. The solar side of the project is not Tesla, that'll be provided by First Solar, but for the storage side, Tesla will be delivering megapacks for what it sounds like is the entirety of the project. Considering Tesla delivered 419 megawatt hours of energy storage in Q2, clearly the 800 megawatt hours that this project will scale up to is pretty significant. Next up today, I just wanted to provide a quick FYI that the New York Times did an interview with Elon Musk that they published over the weekend. 
In this case, I think the New York Times did a much better job covering Elon and providing context than they did back in, I think, 2018 when they had their last interview with Elon. Longtime listeners will remember my thoughts on that at the time. This did seem quite a bit better. We're not going to go super into detail here because it is more of a personal piece. A lot of the Tesla stuff or business related stuff is a lot of stuff that we've talked about or heard. Specifically, Tesla, he mentions how difficult it was from 2017 to mid 2019. And there's some discussion on short selling and how personally Elon has taken that. But one snippet here did stick out to me as being somewhat new. This is from writer Marine Dowd who wrote, quote, Peter Thiel, who helped build a company that became PayPal with Mr. Musk, told me, quote, he's on top of the world. All of the people who have been shorting Tesla stock, who constitute a kind of hate factory against the company, have been totally crushed. And that makes him very happy, end quote. They also spend a significant amount of time in the article discussing Musk's relationship with Grimes, which seems to be going very well, so it looks like Elon is in a really good spot right now, which is always nice to see. All right, next up today, I want to go through Tesla's short interest. We got an update on this on Friday. This is for the settlement date of July 15th, and as of July 15th, Tesla had 12.7 million shares sold short, down 9% from June 30th's level of about 14 million shares. This one is particularly interesting because over that period of time, Tesla reported Q2 delivery and production numbers, and also released the short shorts, and the stock over that same period went from $1,080 per share, an all-time high by the way, at the time at least, to $1,546 on July 15th. That means the valuation of shares sold short went from $15.1 billion on June 30th, all the way up to $19.7 billion on July 15th, an increase of about 30%, despite the fact that the share count actually went down. So for shares sold short, we continue to hit the lowest levels since 2011, while the valuation of those total shares sold short continues to hit new all-time highs. So far, year-to-date, short interest is down about 13.5 million shares, or just over 52% from the roughly 26 million shares that we had sold short coming into the year. The next short interest update will be after market close on Tuesday, August 11th, and that will be for the Friday, July 31st settlement date, which will be our first visibility into short interest after Q2 earnings. All right, next up today, I want to talk about a couple of pieces of news from BMW. The first is that the company has announced new sustainability targets for 2030, which they describe by saying, quote, the aim is to significantly reduce CO2 emissions per vehicle by at least one third across the entire spectrum, end quote. To achieve that, BMW wants to reduce per vehicle emissions by 80% in the production process, 20% in the supply chain, and 40% in the use phase. As a part of this emissions reduction plan, BMW said, quote, in 10 years, the goal is to have a total of more than 7 million electrified BMW Group vehicles on the roads, around two thirds of them with a fully electric drivetrain, end quote. Remember, BMW often uses electrified to include plug-in hybrids. So far through the end of the year in 2019, BMW had delivered more than half a million of these electrified vehicles, like the i3 or the i8, meaning the target is for about six and a half million more over the next decade, 650,000 per year, two-thirds of that being fully electric, would be around 450,000 per year. BMW had previously said that they intend to double the amount of electrified vehicles in their fleet by the end of 2021, so if we assume that's a couple hundred thousand vehicles per year for the next couple of years, then to get to 6.5 million cumulatively by 2030, or through 2030 rather, BMW would have to grow electrified vehicle sales at about 20% per year compound. If that were the case, BMW would be doing about half a million in 2025 and approaching a million per year around 2029 and beyond. And that would be just electrified vehicles, so cut that to two-thirds, and that gives you your full EV sort of numbers. Tesla, as we've talked about, is targeting more than 4 million per year in 2025 and more than 20 million per year, rough numbers here, by 2030. So clearly BMW doesn't have ambitions of that scale. They never really have. That's not their market, obviously just highlighting the differences for those that like to compare the companies. But regardless of those ambitions, it would be nice to see BMW be a little bit more aggressive with their targets for electric vehicles within their own segment. BMW continues to emphasize the importance of flexibility to their design and manufacturing process. In this release, they noted that the BMW 7 Series will eventually come with a full electric option, emphasizing that it would be then available in four powertrains, standard gasoline, diesel, plug-in hybrid, and all electric. BMW then continues on to announce the same for their BMW X1 and BMW 5 Series, saying, quote, Further examples of the quote-unquote power of choice will be the high-volume BMW X1 and BMW 5 Series, which will also be available in the future with all four drivetrain variants, 
fully electric plug-in hybrid diesel and petrol with 48 volt technology, end quote. So BMW, again, fully buying into this flexibility in manufacturing model, which from everything that we have learned from Tesla, everything that they have said on their quarterly earnings calls for years now, combined with a healthy amount of common sense, I just cannot see that being a cost-effective strategy. Yes, maybe you do leverage a little bit of the scale from the other powertrain lineups, but I just really cannot see that offsetting the downsides that you lose from starting with a clean design for an individual type of powertrain, or the throughput benefits from focusing on one powertrain, setting even aside the added difficulty of designing a manufacturing system that incorporates more flexibility. As Tesla talks about all the time, that's the real product, that's where the innovation is being made, and BMW is sacrificing their opportunity for innovation in this area for the powertrain of the future specifically, which at this point is pretty clearly electric, in favor of this so-called power of choice. For some period of time, that will help BMW feel like they are transitioning, when in reality, the plan that they have will never allow them to be fully competitive with a ground-up electric vehicle, and as those become more and more of the market share, BMW will find it increasingly difficult to compete. Whatever reputation they had that allowed them to sell cars in the past will fade in the blink of an eye, and in my opinion, BMW will probably be out of business or be sold off. I think they would be much better served to follow the strategy of instead of saying, we're going to electrify everything, parts of our entire lineup, to just focus on making one good electric vehicle from the ground up, differentiating it from Tesla with interior trim, fancy paint options and wheels, maybe exclusive owner benefits, taking a page from the credit card model, these luxuries that Tesla just doesn't really care about, dominate that niche, get your scale up, and expand from there. That seems to be what Porsche is trying to do with the Taycan. So we get a little bit of visibility into that strategy from Porsche, though I do think they focused on slightly the wrong things, maybe trying to be a bit too true to the brand in terms of track performance over some of the bare essentials for an electric vehicle range and a charging network. Anyway, getting sort of sidetracked there, but I do want to cover one other release here from BMW, and this is about their Munich factory, which produces about 1,000 vehicles per day and 2,000 engines for vehicles per day. BMW announced last week that they would be temporarily shutting down this factory to convert it to the more flexible manufacturing that they're targeting. They say, quote, We are gearing up our Munich plant for the future. Once remodeling is finished, we will be able to produce vehicles with diesel, petrol, and hybrid drivetrains, as well as the fully electric BMW i4, all on the same line. This will allow us to respond flexibly to customer demand, end quote. Okay, so we talked about all that, but case in point here, they're shutting down their vehicle factory for 45 days. That's 45,000 vehicles, 90,000 engines that they are not going to produce. Now for BMW, that's probably okay because of the coronavirus situation. They probably have a lot of excess inventory right now, but a lot of that is circumstantial. So let's assume that BMW didn't actually want to shut its factory down. If we assume the average selling price on those 45,000 vehicles would have been $45,000, that would be $2 billion in lost revenue from the shutdown period to convert your factory. That is a significant opportunity cost to reconfigure your factory for a product that is likely going to be a lower or negative gross margin for you initially. BMW works around a 7% roughly operating margin, but because of economies of scale, those very last units that you produce or end up not producing carry an outsized impact on that operating margin. That's also known as the contribution margin, which on these vehicles I would guess would be more than 10%. So best case, this downtime and that lost revenue is costing BMW $150 million in profit. Worst case, well over $200 million. And we didn't even talk about the additional 1,000 engines per day, which could potentially double the impact if that's stopping vehicle production at another factory. So these are the hidden costs that other automakers have to deal with because they are not starting from scratch. Yes, they don't have to build an entirely new factory, but that's not as advantageous as it may seem at first. A couple hundred million isn't going to get you an entirely new electric vehicle factory, but it's a nice first step. And like we said before, the factory is just as much a product, and that also benefits from a clean, ground-up design. So BMW not opting for that when it comes to the product or for their factories. I don't mean to rip on BMW, I just don't think the strategy is a sound strategy. The one thing I will say for them, they did tie, or said that they plan to tie their board and management compensation to the sustainability targets, which I do still feel are not aggressive enough, but at least they are tying them into the compensation plans. All right, so that will wrap it up for today. As always, thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and sign up for notifications. Make sure you're following me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast. And I'll see you tomorrow for the Tuesday, July 28th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.